I think that's one of the big things for artists. Like we're trying to take something that's intangible or intangible and like, you know, it's, it's, it's might not even exist. And we're trying to bring it into reality and it can be challenging because in our minds, it seems to work so well, but then when we try to put it on paper or when we try to do it, it just doesn't quite come out the way that we think it could or should, or we wanted it to, you know? Yeah. yeah. And that's where refinement is such an important part because you have to be like, okay, I, it's crude. I put the idea out. Now I have to figure out now that it's out on paper or whatever, if it's writing, now I have to figure out how to actually make this thing work. This is Way of the Artist with Brandon Colby Cook and Evan Schulte. Identifying your blocks and demystifying your struggles so that you can claim your own path and make your life a work of art. Ooh, that was loud. At least for me, it was a loud clap. Hey, everybody, how's it going? Welcome to Way of the Artist podcast. We've got another delicious conversation. <laughs> I think I immediately regretted the use of the of delicious in in that, but <laughs> it's too late. We'll do it live. We'll do it live. Um, and uh, we got a good one. So if you clicked on this one, it's um, probably titled <laughs> probably titled "Create Now, Refine Later." Um, and uh, this is this. Uh, I, I've, I'm excited because there's a few things that, that immediately when we started getting into the territory of this conversation, I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm excited to, to talk about a few things there. I think I've got a few things to say and hopefully there will be a few things to discover along the way with it. I felt like I was already kind of having some discoveries just in our initial pre chat to this one. So um yeah, I won't say anything thing else. Brandon, I'll hand it over to you and uh, let's kick this one off. It's a important subject. <laughs> <laughs> it's a, anyway. Um, yeah, no, it's, uh, it, the, when it's one of those things. I mean, I find this to be kind of a, an interesting reoccurring lesson that I learn over and over in spite of the fact that I'm aware of it. I have to keep coming back to it for some reason. And I think it's like perfectionism is such a challenging thing when you're trying to like everything that we do, you know, I think it's part of our, I do think it's part of the way that we're educated. I think it's part of this problem of like, you got to get right. You got to do it properly, you know, and that there's some kind of perfect way, or at least like some right way to do things. And with creativity, it constantly defies that logic. It just constantly challenges that idea. And with creativity, the concept of being right is just so, it's it's like, it, it's so wrong. Yeah. <laughs> and so you just, you, you know, when you're trying, like, I'm trying to get this right. I'm trying to do this perfect. I'm trying to, you know, figure it out. Y you just end up getting blocked because there is no right. There is no perfect. And in the search for it, you end up kind of just spinning your wheels, getting stuck. And mm -hmm. I find myself actually falling back into this weird little pattern every now and then where I'm trying to get something right. I'm trying to get it perfect. And it's not like when I'm doing it, I think I'm trying to do it perfect or right. But I, when I stop and I really kind of look at myself, I'm like, yeah, you, like you think there is some best answer here. You think mm -hmm. there's some best solution. And you think if you just keep doing this kind of, nonsensical spinning your wheels and working at it, you're going to get there. And it's, it's kind of the opposite. Like you have to kind of go like, okay, well, what's, what's going to work right now. And I'll come back later and I will work on it and I'll mm -hmm. refine it, you know, and that's uh, something that I'm continually kind of reminded of in my own process, but I see it in my students as well. You know, it's like uh, with screenwriting and it's so easy to see it in someone else. It's sometimes very hard to see it in yourself. But like, if I'm talking to somebody who's writing a script, I'll be like, well, let's, let's just hear your idea. Like we can, mm -hmm. we can work on it and we can develop your idea, but we need an idea to start with. Right. Yeah. And yeah. And like the same logic goes for me with anything that I do creatively, it's the same idea. What's the first attempt and then we'll work on it. So 
it is an important subject. I think a lot of us get caught up in it. And I think it's uh, one of the, probably one of the number one reasons why we get blocked as artists and creatives and just people trying to do something. Yeah. And, uh, like perfectionism, which is something we've definitely talked about on this show before, but I wanted to point out and just fill everybody in on this because this was something that I think was very important for me in terms of how this conversation has gotten kicked off um, is because you brought in this word refinement, you know, refining refinement. And we had talked about, you know, the calling this episode something along the lines of, you know, like, like why choose refinement over perfection and, and stuff like that. So I think that that's an important element to this conversation is that, um, that sort of shift in perspective of of like why we maybe want to look more into this idea of refining over trying to uh, over perfecting right because perfecting um you know there's a kind of anxiety in it and there's also uh you know i've heard it described as a refusal to move forward right but even you know in the act of trying to perfect something uh you know, it's sometimes there's like this, we have this attitude that, okay, once I get the perfect thing, then it will be there and it will be good and it'll be good forever. Right. And that's just not the way that, that it works. It will eventually, you know, things fall apart. And within art, I think that there's more of this immediate embrace of, you know, in terms of like sort of the master artist, there's this immediate embrace of, of, there's no perfection you can't you, of having to let go of perfection um, and choose a, an idea more of refinement. But I think that that still that that's not just an art that goes within so many realms, even within the sciences, things are always changing, right? It's like you, you test something, you know, you have a hypothesis, you test something and then you test it again. And we're constant. Science is always changing. We're always learning more. And, and so it, science is also a process of refining too, right? So there's still the, this idea of there being these absolutes all the time, even within the sciences, which is abs- which is 100% involved with the objective reality, right? That's something that's constantly changing and, and is being refined all the time. So it exists within all facets of our lives. Um, but I think just in the arts, there's kind of this, there's more of of that spirit of refining at play. And I mean, even though artists can get really perfectionistic and, and, and we're talking about why we want to shift away from those beliefs and attitudes and behaviors, right? Because sometimes we're working in a perfectionistic way and we, we might not even be entirely aware that we're doing that. Right. But, um, you know, it's an important, it's an important shift, uh, I think is, is what was occurring to me when, when we first started engaging in this conversation. Yeah. Perfection is a, is an interesting one. It, it sneaks in there. It comes in a, in a funny way because I don't think we're always trying to be perfect. I don't think we think of it that way. And I mean, I suppose I can only really speak for myself. And I suppose the students that I've worked with and people I've worked with, but I don't find that people like get blocked because they like, I'm trying to make this perfect. Like they don't really think of it that way. And and I don't think of it that way in my own process. It's not like I'm like going like, I need to make this perfect. It's like, I, I think that there's some right way to do it. Like there's some best way to do it. And if I can just figure that out, then I have it and I'm good. And it's like, it, it it's kind of a, it, it's really just perfectionism masked with different words and all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a, something I saw on, uh, uh, I think it was on uh, Instagram or something. I was just kind of scrolling through and uh, this thing popped up and I don't know who said it, but it's not really a quote, but it's just kind of funny comment. And the, it goes like this. He goes, how to write a good story? One, write a bad story. Two, fix it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's like, so it's, it's so perfect because it's like, you got to kind of like, you have to let yourself just write the story, you know, and, and then the refi- you'll refine it. And, and I'm realizing this because like, 
right now I'm on the task of building another website and I'm, I'm going through this process and it's been, it's been coming along quite well, but I get stuck every now and then. And I just, I, I get hung up and like, I was working on this one element for like a couple hours last night and I just spinning my wheels, not getting anything done. No progress is being made. And I have clear objectives that I've set for myself about what I need to accomplish and what I need to do. And I'm like, for two hours, I'm not getting any of those things done. And I've spent two hours at it, maybe more. And I'm like, okay, what's, like, what's going on here? Like you're, you, you know, you just put two hours and you're not doing anything. Like nothing's actually happened here. And I basically came to the realization that I was like trying to be a perfectionist. Cause I was like trying to get it right. I was trying to like perfect it. And I realized like, what do you need to do here? You, you're trying to build something and it just needs to work. Like, you know, it doesn't have to be the best thing, like the ultimate thing that you're going to use, but you're just trying to build this thing on your site and it just needs to do what it's supposed to do. That's really, and like, it doesn't have to look horrible. Like it can look okay. It doesn't, it doesn't mean that it has to look the best that it'll ever look in, in, in the world. And so I said, okay, last night I, I just hit this wall and I said, you've been spending two hours doing nothing and either you're going to walk away tonight and nothing will be accomplished and you'll have spent two hours and got nothing done. And I, it's not like I wasn't working because I was working, but nothing was being accomplished. And I was like, you can either walk away from this having completed nothing and made no progress, or you can do what you're set out to do, create something that works, that looks half decent and refine it later. And I had this realization. I'm like, yeah, like all the pressure's off once I decide to refine it later. And then I showed, um, Gabe, who's like, you know, one of my best friends and mentors. And I said, like, you know, here, this is a really, really rough draft of what I'm doing, but what do you think of this? And he's like, this looks great. This is like 10 times better than what you were creating before. And I was like, all I did was just kind of say, it's good enough. <laughs> Let's mm -hmm. move on. And I'm going to make it better. Don't get me wrong. Like, but it kind of goes to show that sometimes you're not like, you're not that far off. Like good enough is not always doesn't mean it's bad. Yeah. It might not be the best, but it doesn't mean it's bad. It might actually be good. It might even be great. But like, I think part of the problem is, is as a creative people, because there was an element of creativity and design that I had to do with this part of the process. Um, I get caught up in the art of it. I get caught up in like, I can make this better. I can make this cooler. I can make this look, you know, whatever, and feel this way. And it's like, and then I'd get stuck on trying to do that. And you know, it's like, come back and do that later. Like those, those are things you can build upon once you actually just get something that kind of works. Cause, cause right now let's face the facts. It's not working. That's what I basically came to last night. Yeah. And the thing is, is that oftentimes you come back to something after you've put it down for a while and, and you know what you have to do. Cause that's the thing, like, especially when you get that tunnel vision where you're just so focused on one element, one thing. Uh, you lose sight of how it fits into the whole picture. And sometimes you you could spend time really per trying to perfect some little element only to discover, oh, shit, that's not going to work because I've got to do this here. <laughs> you know, and, and so I think that's why sometimes that attitude of, okay, this is this is good enough for now, right? Like, can you live with this? Is are you Are you happy with this? And then again, and then you come back and you refine it, right? Because there's always going to be there's always going to be tinkering that you can do. Mm -hmm. You know, like this reminds me of our law of ending, right? The law of ending. It's like, there's, especially with, you know, artistic stuff and, and like it's, and creative stuff. There is no end to the amount of tinkering that you can do with anything. It's um, so true. It, it just, it's endless. There's yeah. so much that can be done. And yeah. And, and then you, can, you refine something and then you can refine something else because you refine that. It's just, it gets, it gets ludicrous. Yeah. yeah. And so at some point you have to be able to go, okay, like <laughs> this is good. This is good enough. And you can, and you can put it down. And sometimes there's things that are, yeah, like they're ongoing. Like you're talking about like a website, you know, like, holy shit, man. Like websites are notorious for like they're the never ending amount of work that you can put into them. Like they're notorious. It's almost like a running joke for people who, you know, run their own websites, which is like, you can, yeah, there's always something you can be doing on it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, okay, but what, when is it enough? 
right? When is it enough and, and when does it actually need to be refreshed and, and changed and things, you know, and it's usually not as much as we, we think it, it needs to be, but yeah, like with anything, um, there's an endless amount of tinkering that you can do, um, in any art form. You can say like, Oh, you know, that this word could change in this script or in this novel, this one would be a little bit better and this one and this one, like there's, yeah, okay, but at what point are we, like, is this really drastically improving the experience of the person who's going to be, you know, seeing this or reading this or whatever it is? Like, how much is it really going to change their enjoyment, experience, impact that it's going to have on them, right? Like, after a certain point in time, after you've done, you know, a few passes of refining on it, like, you've pretty much got it. Like, it's pretty much going to be what it's going to be. And if it's still garbage, then that just means that it's like, well, then from the out, from the outset, it was, it had a ceiling it had a limit to it, to what you could actually do with it. Right. There's only so much you can polish a turd as they say. (laughs) Um, So true. (laughs) But yeah, yeah. Like that's, I I think that that's, um, yeah, I think that that it's very important to, to keep in mind. And, and one thing I, I want to open this part up of the conversation, because I think that this is, was one of the more exciting things that, that struck me about this is that having an attitude, having an approach of refining over perfecting is actually, I'll use this sort of word, which might be a bit woo woo for some people, but you know, it has, um, it has an, a different, energy to it or I could say a different quality to it the energy of of refining says okay we're gonna try some stuff out you know like we're gonna we're gonna put some things out there we're gonna come forth with the best ideas that we have you know or the best vision that we have at the moment and and then we're gonna we're gonna work with it we're gonna mold it we're gonna shape it we're gonna see we're gonna throw some of it away we're gonna keep some of it here right as opposed to perfecting there is this there is this sense of constriction Mm. with perfection right like um you know we were saying like like there's uh we were using the word atmosphere you know at one point we said like there's an atmosphere of refining and there's an atmosphere of perfection and the atmosphere of perfection is i have to get this right i can only come out with brilliant ideas (laughs) and these are the only whereas refining is like you're you can have shit ideas Shit ideas can come out, right? Like, because it's not such a big thing. They're, we're not quite as hung up and attached and and married to anything that we that comes out of us, right? There's because we we're coming in with a recognition that it doesn't have to be perfect, and that this is something that we can play with. You bring in a really great element. I'm glad you brought it over to this because, yeah, the atmosphere for creativity is such an under discussed thing. You know, it's like we don't really talk about that even enough on the show as much as like, you don't really always talk about that in where you're learning it, You know, it's, I mean, I think about some of the early scripts that you and I wrote together and we used to get together and we would write the scripts together and you know, that doesn't work with everybody. But one of the reasons why I think it worked with us is we'd be like, okay, I'm going to try something here. <laughs> I don't know if this will work, but let's try it. And we would do that. We would basically, and then if our ideas were not really working, we would kind of, you know, we, we would like banter a little bit and we'd joke around with each other, but it was never mean. It was always kind of like, okay, like, but I learned so much writing with you because I learned when I was being too cliche or I was being too, um, you know, on the nose and stuff like that, because, you know, but I, but I try the idea and it's, it's really great to write with somebody who's open-minded because when you don't take it personally, you try something and then you go, okay, well, like this is a little bit too on the nose. It's like too cliche. And then you go, oh, see, if I was writing alone, I probably wouldn't have realized that. I I wouldn't have realized that until someone had read the draft and then they would have seen it, you know? Mm -hmm. And Um, I think the atmosphere we created in our writing experience, like those were great memories for me. And I I like the scripts and stuff we came up with, but it was a great atmosphere because um, it just had this kind of like, we're just trying to get to the best way we can do this. And we both accepted that we were learning 
and that we would kind of figure it out trial by error. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, I find with myself, like, I don't always do that with myself, you know, like I am pretty experienced as, at this point, I've done a lot of, uh, you know, I've been in the arts for a long time, but there's still moments where I slip back into this, like just being hard on myself, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think we all do. And I think it's one of those things, you know, you just kind of got to be aware of, and you kind of got to go, okay, like I'm being too hard on myself here. Like I need to give myself a break. Let's just try an idea and see if it works. Um, I guess I'll share something real quick, but I had a client this week um, and I'm so proud of her because when we started working together, she would always say like, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But she, like she said, I don't know. And we were joking about it and we started laughing about it. We're like, like, she's like, I know, I don't know. I say it like a hundred times, but now instead of saying, I don't know, she, she, she's developing the confidence to just trust her ideas. And the other day when we had our session, um, she came in and, and I said, okay, well, tell me the story. How does it evolve? What's happened? And she's like, okay, well, basically it's the same, but I had this idea. Now, I don't know if this works, but here's what I was thinking. And before she said, it, I'm like, oh, I'm so proud of you. Like the fact that you're just coming in, willing to try an idea, you, you're like, I don't know if it'll work, but let's just try it. I'm like, mm -hmm. that attitude you have right now is going to help you so much. And her script this is a first time writer. Her script and everything she's done, like, I, I I don't know how to express how high quality it is. And I think a big part of that is it just reminds me that, like, she came in humble and she refines her ideas and she's becoming more confident in refining her ideas, which is making her screenplay great. And it just re reminds me, it's like, yeah, like, we all have to do it, whether we're just beginning or whether we've done, like, you know, 30 screenplays, it doesn't really matter. It, it's always the same. You got to come in with an idea. You don't know if it's going to work and then you work on it. Yeah. 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 You see what there is. Cause like, yeah, I remember, you know, I have memories of, of, you know, like sitting around like the computer with you and, you know, we would each take turns in the writer's chair at some point. Like sometimes we were going together, but sometimes it's like, you know, one of us is taking a break. It's like, I've got nothing. It's like, well, I've got an idea. I'm going to try it. And then she's like, okay. And you just sort of sit back and, and, or, you know, like lay back on the couch or something like that. And then it's like, okay, I finished, come take a look. Right. And then come and take a look at it. Or, you know, you would look at what, what I did, or I would look at what you did. And, you know, sometimes it was, it was like, okay, I really like this. I don't think that this works, but I think that this is like a good track for it. It's like, okay, cool. Right. And so then, we, but we have something to build off of. And other yeah. times it was just like, we would look at each other's stuff and we'd be like, I love this. Yeah. Like, totally. I fuck, I fucking love this. This is terrific. Right. And, yeah. and sometimes there would still, there, there would still be refining required, but it was like, all right, we've, we've got something that's still exciting and, yeah. and, and interesting and compelling for us. Uh, at least as writers, which is still, I think one of the, is, is the best metric for you as an artist is like, do you like it? <laughs> you, know, well, um, you know, the other thing too, about our writing process, I'm thinking about the one script we wrote, the townsfolk. And um, I remember we, we discussed when we wrote it, we're like, Hey, look, we're going to write a horror movie or try to at least. And let's, let's just make these characters make really, really smart decisions. And we said, no excuse. Like there's no, we're not going to let anyone get into trouble because they did something dumb. Dumb. No one's tripping and falling. Like none yeah. of that. And, yeah. and we, that was one of our, and our they still get fucked. Cause that was one of the things that we thought was scary. Exactly. Right? It was like, if you did all of the smart and right things and you still got screwed. Yes. Yeah. And, and that was kind of good because we both had a bit of a, we had a, a certain standard that we were trying to keep. And so it was like, okay, well, I know I got to write this scene and maybe Evan doesn't have an idea, but I, I have an idea, but I know that Evan's not going to let me get away with like, he trips and falls and boom, like some <laughs> dumb shit, or she runs up the <laughs> stairs when the bad guy comes like, you know what I mean? Like yeah. none of that nonsense. Right. So when you were, when you were writing or when I was writing, I was like, Hey, what would be the smart choice? And I remember there were moments where we would be like, okay, I got them to this point. And I like, I don't know what they should do, but what do you think would be the smartest thing you could do in this moment? And we would talk that out and we'd try and work out what the smartest idea was. And then be okay. Remember, I don't know if you remember this, 
But there was a day where the character escapes from the bathroom out of the house because he knows something's yeah. fucked, right? <laughs> and we're like, but how do you even break out of a, a, a bathroom window? We were like, let's work this out. And we really like, we kind of like, will you like, they were knocking at the door being like, are you okay in there? And he, he's like trying to pretend that everything's fine. Meanwhile, he's trying to crawl out the window so he can run away. And like, we were really trying to work out the, the, the elements of that. Right. And yeah. the thing is, is we didn't like in theory, it's like, yeah, the person jumps out the window and they just run away from the house. Like that's kind of what happens. But we, we really made that moment feel stressful. Mm -hmm. We did that by like thinking it out and working it out and refining it, you know? And, and I think like there's a certain amount of yeah, these things will happen in your story or or in your art or whatever you're doing. And you kind of go, okay, like this is what I'm trying to do. And you know that, but refinement goes like, how do I, like, how do I really flesh this out? How do I deepen it? How do I make it more, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and and we just figured out ways to add more stress to that moment, you know, to, to enhance that moment. And I mean, it's a silly little moment in a horror movie, but it's like, we turned a moment that could have been less interesting, a little bit more interesting. And that's what refinement really does, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It just keeps on getting you closer and closer and closer to what you're trying to do. And, and yeah, again, is not so concerned with perfection. Yes. Right? It's concerned with excellence, right? Which is another thing that I think that I remember you first telling me about is like, you know, go for excellence over, over perfection. Right. And I think that, uh, in some ways, this conversation is a refinement to that. <laughs> no kidding. Right. That, Cause it can be, there can be a fault in that logic, you know, like go for excellence over perfection. You can still be like, Hey, I'm going for excellence, but really you're just deceiving yourself because you're actually going for perfection. Yeah. You because can't. the thing is, is like excellence is still kind of an abstract thing. Yes. Right. It's like, well, what is excellent? Yeah. Right. Like, and, and I think that refinement, what I like about that word, why I'm so happy that like when we were having our pre-discussion that you said that word is because to me, it was the key to this whole conversation, um, is that refinement is a process. It's not a result. Refining is a process, um, yes. which well, is, well, yeah. 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 Which I'm just realizing now is part of yeah. like what I think is so great about it is like, it's a process. It's, it's not a, a result. It's about, and we just, just had, had a, a conversation it, about results and stuff. We just had a realization, you know, like that's kind of, that's kind of how, you know, right. Cause like, um, when you're going for a result, then, you know, you're getting caught up in perfection when you're going for process, you, then, you know, that you're not bullshitting yourself. Cause if you think about mm. that, like I, I do remember saying something like that, go for excellence over perfection. And, you know, looking back and I'm like, that's what I was talking about is like, go for like the best you can do as opposed to like, I got to make it like, look awesome. I might got to make it be awesome. And I'm thinking about last night when I got caught in my, in my head, in my own little trap. And I'm like, I'm trying to get a perfect result, not be in a, in an excellent process. And like, when I went to process and the result that came out of it, like even today, when I got feedback from Gabe, he was like, this is great. And it was like, yeah, there's going to be work. I'm going to make it better. I still see how it could be better, but it was like, I went for the best that I could do at that moment. And I'm actually realizing something, as you pointed this out, it's about process process really gives you a, a lot of a break because it goes like, okay, like I'm going to get the best result I can right now. And then I'm going to get yeah. a better result because I'm going to refine that result later. But like, this is, this doesn't have to be the end result. This is a result that I'm getting for now. And I will come back to it later and get, and just make that result better. Enhance. Yeah. yeah. One thing that, um, you may or may not know about me, Brandon, is, uh, I love a lot of like, sort of like competition shows where people have to make stuff. Sometimes okay. it's artistic, but even like baking shows and what I just, I just finished watching this show, um, called next in fashion, um, which wasn't my favorite in terms of like that style of show, but it's still interesting. Cause you know, it's a great way to get a window into some creative 
place that people work in and and anyhow uh one of the things about those shows is that people like the contestants are always given like some ridiculous time limit to yeah, achieve right. things right and like and and it's very intentional it, it's part of the drama of the show is and and i know from some of them they say it's like yeah like they when they're putting a lot of the challenges together for for these people to do they'll say like okay well how much time would a person like to to be able to to complete a challenge like this or to complete a piece like this it's like okay they would need you know ideally you'd want like five or six hours okay great we're going to give them four (laughs) right like just like enough so it's doable but like they have to really push it and the thing is is that you know yeah would all those people take more time like if they if they could have it absolutely um but the thing is that you still see such incredible things come out from people even in those conditions right so sometimes it's like that's one of the things about refinement is that sometimes there's a time limit mm-hmm. right like because if you take too long sometimes that thing is just like that that thing is gone mm-hmm. now right like there's there can be a thing of 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 just y- you have to like just just push even if you set yourself sometimes an arbitrary date or a time that's why a lot of people say that it's not because like you must get this done it's like no give yourself a date because it's just sometimes it's just a motivation for people and it doesn't i don't think that works for everybody but um for some people it does and it's because like okay well i give myself that time and for a lot of people i think that it helps people to just move forward it's like to not get stuck on in perfection and little things it's just like okay you have until this day to get something done and sometimes you do absolutely have to hit those deadlines um sometimes it's just like a personal challenge kind of a thing but you know when you really stick to those things i think that that's in a weird way it's like a hack it's like one of those um you know it doesn't acknowledge like the whole thing that we're talking about as far as the process but it's like a hack that gets you there Mm -hmm. inadvertently or at least it can potentially I think deadlines are important in, in the process of creativity because creativity can be quite endless where you can just do more and more and more and refine and refine and refine. And so I think, um, deadlines can be very helpful at just giving you kind of a point where you can go, okay, like whatever happens when I get to this point, like that's what's going to be, you know, and uh, something I learned with screenwriting, cause you know, like I, I, I got hired to write a few screenplays. I learned that with contracts because when you get hired to write a screenplay, you should always put a deadline, like basically like a limit on your, on your contract. Um, otherwise you might not get paid the other half of your money or whatever payment is left. Right. So like three drafts, or five drafts or whatever, one draft, whatever it is. But it's like, once that's done, this is complete. You know what I mean? And I had some uh, contracts that I took on, which were open-ended contracts and the script got rewritten many times. And it's like, it's never enough. There's always something you can do. You can do this, you can do that, you can do whatever. And eventually there was a few projects where I just had to walk away from because I was like, like, this, there's no end point here. Like this script is just a work in progress until, you know, you finally get this thing greenlit or whatever. And there's always something to do is there's always some idea. And the more producers and people that get involved with it and like someone wants this and someone wants that and it's fine. But like at the end of the day, you know, when you're getting, when you're doing this for you, like, this is how you make money, you know, you still got to put food on the table. You got to figure out how to pay your bills and all that shit. Um, you know, I'm moving on to other projects and it's not like I want to give up on this project, but like, we need a new contract. You know what I mean? Because if I'm going to keep working indefinitely, like I'm not going to work because eventually it just becomes, it's not worth it anymore because like you say you have a contract and in your mind, and, and this is probably good for all artists who are like freelance type artists, right? Like you have a, in your mind, like, it's going to take me this long to do this project and I'm going to put this many hours in. So if they pay me this amount of money, it's worth it. But once those hours start doubling or tripling or quadrupling or more, you start to go like, okay, like when we were doing this in the beginning, I was making like, you know, 
$20 an hour, $50 an hour, $100 an hour. Like that's what the exchange was. But now I'm making like $5 an hour. Now I'm making like $2 an hour. This isn't worth it anymore. And, you know, you have to, you'd have to be in love with the project um, at that point. And it's like, you know, you just, it just becomes kind of the, the return isn't as good. So my point is, is like mm -hmm. a deadline can kind of give you a point where it's like, what's the, and, I, and maybe artists can take this as like a, a way to do their deadlines. Look at it as the point of like return. When is it too much work where the return isn't worth it anymore? So say you want to write a screenplay just for yourself. You're not even getting paid. How much time and hours and energy you know, does it take to write a screenplay in general? Okay. So you know that. And then you go, well, how much time and energy am I willing to put into this before I, you know, I need to move on to my next project or I need to move on to something else before it's just not worth it to refine it anymore because refinement can be endless. And so I think deadlines can be a very useful way to say like, I will refine up until this point. And at that point it is what it is. And maybe I'll come back to it in a year or a month or whatever, but like it needs to be put on a shelf for a little while if I haven't figured it out and I need to move on. Um, because, you know, like I can tell you that as, as a writer, it's fucking brutal when you get caught on a project and you're not really creating anymore. You're just refining and you're just editing the littlest, dinkiest, tiniest stuff over and over and over again. And it's just like not fun anymore. And it's not rewarding anymore. And you're kind of like, well, you don't even need me to do this. You could like literally do this yourself or you could hire someone else to do this. Like the stuff you're asking isn't even creative anymore. It's just mm -hmm. logistics, you know? So maybe that helps with people because I think like refinement can become a problem, but I think you need to kind of set a limit. Like, okay, like I'm, it doesn't need to be perfect off the bat, but also like, I'm only going to refine for so long before, you know, like there's only so much you can do. You got to move on at some point. Hey everybody, this is Evan, and this episode is brought to you by my book. Yes, I recently released a book called The Actor's Awakening, Connecting Spirituality to Craft. Expand yourself as an actor and your craft through a spiritual perspective. Take a journey that will explore universal philosophies and insights to help you understand human nature in a profound way, and develop practices to take your work to another level. Again, that's The Actor's Awakening, Connecting Spirituality to Craft, available on Kindle and paperback on Amazon. And as always, if you like the show, please subscribe. Yeah, and uh, yeah, like you said, like in, when you hit that point of diminishing returns, right, where it's like, come on, this is not fundamentally changing what this this whole thing is, right? We need to, to say, okay, time to move on with this one. Um, yeah. It's kind of like us when we're, when we were stuck on a title, you know, like we, we try to figure out these kind of creative titles for these podcasts, but there's always a point where we're like, okay, like we've thrown out a bunch of ideas. What's the best one we got? Let's just work with that, you know, because yeah. there's a certain point where it's like, we could spend like, and we spent a lot of time sometimes just trying to figure out a title for the episode and we've really struggled, but there's yeah. a point where you just have to say, okay, like either we don't have a title and we don't know what we're calling this or we just pick the best one that we came up with and we just use that for now. Yeah. Um, and you just, you, cause at the end of the day, like, what are we going to do? Are we going to talk about the perfect title for a podcast all day or are we got actually record a podcast? Yeah. yeah. Especially since like, we usually know what we're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We know, we know like what we're like the subject matter, but we're just trying to come up with the title of this. Yeah. Um, you know, which is uh, a whole interesting yeah it's a it's a creative process in in and of itself just just doing that and sometimes the titles are right there right yeah. it's like it's like sometimes yeah it's that's it that's the title up with you know like the first or second and then we try like 20 other ideas and we just come back to the one of the first ones but i think there's something important about that though i do think sometimes you might find you came up with the perfect idea right off the bat but you try 20 other ideas that don't work so you know mm. that you came up with the right one in the beginning so I don't think right. it's wasted time. I think that's actually a valuable and important part of the process. Totally. Yeah. Like, um, one of the things that, uh, I did in publishing my book, um, so like, it's like self publishing, you've got to do a lot of stuff. You're on your own, you have, you know, but you have friends and people who are helping you out along the way, uh, hopefully. And, um, I was, 
I, I got this sort of like program to, to help me with like figuring out some of the, the stuff with like publishing on Amazon and, and, you know, like keywords and stuff like that. So anyhow, the, this, um, this guy who's developed this program and he, he gives all of these sort of, um, he writes a lot of blogs and does a lot of video lessons to just like, Hey, here's like some, some useful things. And one of them was about writing the summary of your book, just like your, your description for Amazon. And one of the things was write 20, write 20 opening lines to it and kind of gave like an idea of like, you want your opening line to kind of contain these three elements, you know, most likely you want, you really want them to have these three elements. So, you know, people really know what the book is, what it's for and what they're, you know, like what they can expect to get out of it. And so write 20 of these things. And so I did, I wrote 20 of them and yeah, it's a challenge. Like you've got to really start, but it's, yeah, it's another way that forces you into, into just getting creative and thinking about a different things. But it's also, again, it's reinforcing this, this idea of refinement like look you got to write 20 of these things so start writing <laughs> yeah right start writing something it's like uh you know a while back i m- had mentioned you know in january i did a write 30 songs in 30 days it was a similar thing just just do it you don't have time to think too hard and get get perfectionistic about this because you have you you have to get all of these out you've got to get through all of these and some of them don't work some of them do some of them are clearly better than others. Um, some have something really terrific that you can work with. Some of them, you know, don't have much to work with. So, you know, but like there's, you, you run the gamut of it, but you know, it's a, it's a terrific thing to, to just engage with because you don't know, mm-hmm. you know, you, you don't know if, you know, song or, or sentence number 14 is going to be something really phenomenal or, you know, and, and again, even in that process was like refining, it's like, Oh, okay. I actually kind of like how, how sentence 14 comes out, but I don't quite like that element of it. So sentence 15 is kind of a takeoff of sentence 14. And then sometimes it sentence forms the other idea, and then it forms the other idea and you start to get clarity. You start to get more and more clarity and being like, Oh, okay. Until you, you finally sort of land on something that you go, all right. I like this and then you can move move on with it but um yeah there's something uh about some of these little little processes that you can you can do and and I think yeah like it's like deadlines as well as sometimes having to create a sheer volume of something yeah. <laughs> can sometimes just force you to just like you know just let go a little bit Mm-hmm. You know, just let go of, of some of, some of your hangups and, and just get to creating something, you know, just get to putting some pen to paper and seeing what comes out the other side of it. And then working with what, with th- that, which is kind of raw material, you know, you've got to create your raw material first. So then you know what to do with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's uh, so I have this process for creating a, a, a movie concept. And as long as you hit these basically several elements, you, you have a, you have a story, you have a workable idea, right? And, and I, I think that's the right word for it. It's workable. doesn't mean it's great. doesn't mean it's awesome. doesn't mean it's not cliche, but it like would work. You know, you could actually Mm -hmm. do all these elements. You're going to have a movie. You can actually have a movie and you could communicate the movie or story and be able to tell someone else about it. And they would understand what you were talking about. Cause that's a big thing for a lot of people. You know, they, they, they go, I got a movie idea and I'm like, tell me it. And they, and they explain it and you're like, hey, what's this movie about? Like, like, yeah, I get this. You got this cool idea with aliens, but like what happens? Like, what's the movie? You know what I mean? Like yeah. it's just kind of a weird obtruse idea. Right. So one of the things I do in a, my screenwriting course or one of my screenwriting courses is I, uh, the first week everybody shows up and you're supposed to create seven concepts. Basically just create a concept every day. The process is really easy, but create concepts. Well, I had this one student come in and uh, they, uh, they were like, they came the next week and they're like, I have three that like, I created a bunch of concepts, but I have three and I don't know which one to choose. And I'm like, okay, let's hear your pitches. And they pitched them all and they were all actually pretty good. And I'm like, okay, great. This works, that works, and this works. And I was like, which one do you want to do? 
And I'm like, well, I kind of want to do this one because of this way. I kind of want to do this one. And so they then they started talking it out and they and they picked one of them. But it was like, I'm like, you know what's really great about this? You're about to do this course and you're going to write a screenplay because you got, you know, you got three good concept ideas and you've got one. But what's really nice about this is once you're done this process, you're going to have two more movies you're ready to write if you want to make those next two ideas. And mm -hmm. it's like one of the great things about doing a little extra is that sometimes it gives you more like this person started the course with three movies to write. And what's exciting is you kind of like go like, well, I want to get this movie done because I'm going to move on to writing my next concept, which I already have worked out before I'm even done this movie. And I think, um, you know, this, uh, this kind of idea that you're talking about, about like write 20 of them or create a bunch of them. I think it's really important for the artist to remember that even if you don't use like a fraction of the stuff, like, like much of the stuff that you create, it doesn't mean it was done in vain. It doesn't mean it wasn't important. It might be valuable somewhere else, or it might help you uh, with what you're doing. It might serve it some way. And I think sometimes we, we get caught up in the idea of we don't want to do wasted work. It's like, well, what's the point? I'm only going to make one movie in this course. It's like, yeah, well, yeah, it's true. But it doesn't mean that having more concepts is not going to be useful you know? And, and the other thing too is I'll just kind of share this because I think it's relevant, but like the other reason why I get people to create seven movie concepts before they even start their one concept that they do is because I want them to know and understand how to actually create a movie concept. Because if they just come in and they create one as, as their instructor, teacher, mentor, as someone trying to help them, how do I know you really get the process? If you could replicate that process several times, then I know you understand what you're doing. And that means that I can confidently send you off into the world, knowing that you know how to create a concept after this course is done. Yeah. And in yeah. some ways it's also like a proof of creativity, you know, because a lot of people get really precious about this one idea that they have, you know, you're really quiet on my end for some reason. Sorry. That's my, that's my bad. I had to shut down my, I had to turn my volume down for a second. Um, what I was saying was what I loved about what you're describing is, yeah, like not only does it get people so like they've done it enough times that, you know, they, they really have sort of solidified that process within them. It's also to me a proof of creativity, right? Like you've got a ton of ideas in you, right? And yeah, and like some of them are better than others, but you've got a ton of ideas in you. So don't get too like hung up and precious about, Oh, this one idea, this one idea, this one idea. It's like, you've got a million ideas. Yes. Right. So again, move on, right. Refine it and then move on. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there's always a point. There's always a point. Um, I want to change gears for a quick second because, okay. uh, this was something that I was like, Oh, this, this conversation is so relevant to something that I just saw today. Uh, so I've become, I've become a bit of a casual follower of formula one racing. Uh, I got really into it through watching that, uh, series drive to survive. And, you know, I'm not a diehard who will get up at some, you know, ungodly time of the day to watch races live, but I'll watch the highlights and I kind of follow like what's going on in it. Um, so they're getting ready for the new season. That is the actual racing season, not the new season of uh, of Drive to Survive, which is also coming. Um, but this year is a very interesting year because there's it's some have said that this is like the biggest year in changes to the cars that's ever happened. So um, and most of it has to do with like the body design. So there's been huge changes to body design um, for all of the competing teams to 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 now take on board and and so they've been developing these new cars for quite a while now uh some of them investing more of their resources than others but these are all like these teams have like millions of dollars like i think that they just put in a cap now like recently for all of these teams but it's like they can spend like 140 million dollars a year <laughs> <laughs> right it's like you got 140 million dollars a year there's teams of hundreds of people um 
engineers and like people in aerodynamics and car design and stuff like that. Like people, like all of these experts in these very specific fields designing these vehicles. So anyhow, they're all this over the last few days. They've been, yeah, stay with me, people. They've been testing their new cars on the track for the first time, right? So everyone's there at the test track in Barcelona and they're, they're finally getting like their sort of first like look on the track and seeing how they're, they're performing. And (laughs) pretty much all of the new cars are experiencing this thing called porpoising, which was something that I'd never heard of before. But porpoising is basically when the car is getting at like a really high speed, usually down like a straight line up at high speeds, it starts bouncing up and down, like just kind of like woom, 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 woom. And it's because the way that the car is designed basically is like they're, they're made to generate all of this downforce, right? To keep the, the car attached to the road. And the thing is like, so what's happening is they're achieving these high speeds. So they're being pushed down to the, down to the road. But once they're hitting a certain low point, it's losing its downforce. So then it makes it go back up again and then it goes back up and then it gets all that downforce again. And then it moves itself back down. And this is hugely problematic and not just in terms of speed, but like it can make the drivers really nauseous. Um, it's physically very uncomfortable for the drivers to do. There's all kinds of issues that it presents. So I was, I couldn't help but be like, this is hilarious. Here we have like, you know, some of like the most incredible, you know, car engineers in the world. They've been spending, like they spent millions of dollars developing these things, running them through simulations and wind tunnels and all of this stuff. And they're all (laughs) encountering this issue. And now they've got to figure out how they fix it. Yeah. <laughs> so they've got to figure out in a very short window of time. It's like, okay, but like it happened to all of them. And I'm just like, I was like, this is such a process of refinement that like, even with the, the, the knowledge and years of expertise that, that exist within all of these companies, it came time to put the car on the road. And there's this problem that none of them saw, saw coming. <laughs> That's a great example. So That's I hope that was worth it. I hope that was worth it for everybody. I know it took uh, took a little while to get through, but I thought it was pretty funny. And I love that it's called porpoising. <laughs> yeah. No, it was worth it for me. It's uh, it's the perfect example of like rubber meets the road kind of uh, scenario where it's like, I had this, um, I had this, uh, I was journaling this morning and I've chosen a certain font and a certain kind of style for this new website that I've developed. And Um, it looks cool. It has a certain style to it and it kind of works, but there's certain applications in which that font, that style, um, it, it just doesn't, it's not as refined, right? Like, so there's a, and I'm, and I'm kind of like running into some, some like visual challenges when I'm trying to do certain things. I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. Or maybe I even got the idea from a certain template or the way something else was done. And I'm realizing like, well, with the style that I've chosen, it just, it like runs into a limitation when I'm actually doing it. And I was writing about this Mm. this morning. I'm like, you know, this is a a great example of what I have this idea in my mind of what I think I'm going to do and how I think it's going to look and how I think it's going to work. And then I actually do it and it doesn't align with what my vision or my mind was projecting out into reality. And it's the, you know, when you actually see it, because the font that I chose is kind of a script type font. It's uh, it has a bit of a, a blotchy, like the ink kind of spilled out of the pen a little bit kind of feel, which mm. is really good in a lot of scenarios, but in certain scenarios, it just looks a little rough, just yeah. looks a little less <laughs> clean and, and not, and it doesn't work with a certain type of like the juxtaposition of style. And so it really made me realize this morning. I'm like, there is a certain amount of allowance I need to give myself for trial and error. Whereas like in my mind, I have this vision of what I'm going to do. And then I, I go do it. And I have to make room for the fact that when I do it, it might not fit like I think it'll fit. And I think this is a very important part of this refinement talk we're having where it's like perfection expects your mind 
and the reality to be the same thing always and for it always to work. Mm. Refinement is I'm going to see how this works. And if it's not what I think it is, then I'm going to have to figure that out. You know, there's a, there's a certain allowance you give yourself and it, it does take a lot of the pressure off. No, I, that's, uh, I, I think that that's for me, I'm like, that's kind of huge. I think what you just said, like perfection is, is the expectation that, that how your what's in your mind and reality are going to line up. Hmm. Is that what, or how do you put, I feel like you put it a bit more, I think, I feel like you put it better or a bit more eloquently than I just. But that's, that's essentially what you said is, yeah, essentially what it is. It's like, that's how I see, that's how I was seeing it. It's like, you expect that your mind and reality will be the same thing. And it's disappointing when they're not, and and you have trouble because you don't know how to deal with it. Whereas refinement is you, you make the allowance that what's in your mind might not work the same way in reality, what you think it will. And Mm -hmm. it becomes actually, you know, a perfect word for it. You mentioned science earlier. It becomes an experiment. It's a, it's a, I'm going to, I have a hypothesis in my mind that I'm going to do it this way and it's going to work. And then uh, in reality, when I do it, the hypothesis is not adding up. It's not actually working. The theory doesn't fit like I thought it would. And now because I'm experiencing in reality what's happening now I can deal with it and refine it. But um, I'm not upset about it because I knew going in that it might not work the way I think it'll work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. That's great. I love that. I love that because it is, it's, it's, it's so true. It's like, and, and it can be so upsetting, you know, where it's just like, it's like, I, I, you know, I'll embarrassingly admit to moments in my life where it's just like, no, <laughs> you know, like where I'm just having like a little tantrum to myself. It's like, it's supposed to come out like this, not like this. Why don't you come out like this? And it's like, <laughs> well, because, you know, the idea in your head and, and reality are not, are not the same thing. And, uh, that's okay. That's all right. Like, especially untested. You know, like that's the other thing, like, that's why I think it's so important to just try things over and over again, because you got to test it. Like you got to, you know, you got to try it out. Like it just, it just, you you know, I think the part of the pressure that a lot of people put on themselves is they haven't even done it and they think they got to get it right. And it's like, man, I, like, I'm finally, like, I feel like in this point in my career, I'm starting to put out screenplays and I'm starting to figure out things like about how to do this at the level I want to do this at. But like, I had to write, a, for, for me, I had to write a lot of screenplays. Like some people can figure this stuff out maybe quicker or maybe they just have better mentors or guidance or whatever. But for me, a lot of, like, I'm not saying what I wrote before wasn't good, but it was like a lot of my learning happened by just trying stuff out and then seeing what works and seeing what doesn't work. And I think a lot of people like working with me because I have that experience. Like I know what it's like to kind of try something and, and, and why it doesn't work. And when you actually do it, not only does it help you have a gauge, um, about what to do, but you can also sometimes explain it a lot better. Like one of the most frustrating things I find with vision and like what's in your mind and then what's in reality is when you can't explain your vision, like you can't communicate it. And, and it's, it's so frustrating. Like, and I know people also have this experience because they have this story and they're like, I have this great story. It's so great. Like, just let me tell you what it is. And like, they tell you the story and you're like, Hey, you know, and they're, and, and they're like, frustrated because like, well, you're not getting it. It's like, it's like this. And it's like, maybe it is in your mind, but like in the words that you're using and the way that you're describing it, it's not funny. It's not scary. It's not what you are are saying that you're trying to do. And that person's like, like frustrated because they can't express what is in their mind. And, and I think the hardest part about it is like, what's in your mind might actually be great but there is a certain amount of like rubber meets the road. Like there's a certain amount of like, it needs to, it needs to actually work, you know, Mm -hmm. in reality. And 
I think that's one of the big things for artists. Like we're trying to take something that's intangible or intangible and like, you know, it's, it's, it's might not even exist. And we're trying to bring it into reality and it can be challenging because in our minds, it seems to work so well, but then when we try to put it on paper or when we try to do it, it just doesn't quite come out the way that we think it could or should, or we wanted it to, you know? Yeah. yeah. And that's where refinement is such an important part because you have to be like, okay, I, it's crude. I put the idea out. Now I have to figure out now that it's out on paper or whatever, if it's writing, now I have to figure out how to actually make this thing work. Yeah. 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 And I think that one of the big things with this too is that with with this attitude, it, it's not saying like, well, don't try on your on your first time around. It's not what it's saying. It's not we're not saying like don't don't really give something your your full energy and attention and and effort. But rather, it's like you know, let just let go a little bit of of some of these things because you want to go back like not just like you'll have to but you want to go back and and go through it and it's really more so a you know it's just a it's just a tool of being able to like in some ways just kind of like get get it done Mm -hmm. you know in in a certain kind of way not getting stuck like like don't get stuck just like like go go just just do it and do it as fully and as well as you can possibly do it but just like but with the knowledge that there's going to be tweaking there's going to be refining and it's going to get better and it doesn't have to be perfect and you know like all of this stuff it's and that it's really it's it's uh it's healthier and it's more productive ultimately Mm. yeah well you know i want to talk about the drinks that we're having And, um, you know, I'll just say Speak this in my before, mind. But before we uh, share is like something you said kind of before we started recording was like, you mentioned the idea of like the spirit of refinement. And I thought, you know, like you talked about the attitude of it, but I think that's kind of a, you know, it's kind of like, like there's, you know, like w- what is spirit? Like, like, I'm not talking like the woo woo thing. Like I'm kind of like talking about like the, 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 the environment, the energy, the atmosphere, the, the the feeling of it, you know, when you give yourself this kind of like room to play, you know, and the law of play just seems to be coming up in a big way in this conversation, because I think refinement in a weird way has a lot to do with play because it's like refinement is like, well, I'll play with it. I'll, I'll work it out. You know, I'll, I'll try this, I'll try that. And, you know, and I'll sharpen the edges or, or around the edges or whatever you're trying to do, right. You're, you know, you, 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 and, and you'll tweak it, you know, and there, there, that can be fun. It doesn't have to be like, I know a lot of writers, they like hate editing and it's like, but editing can be so fun. It can be fun. You don't have to, you know, so there's a perceptual thing, I think, too, the way we look at refinement. And um, I just wanted to mention that. Mm-hmm. No, but uh, okay, Here, here's my, uh, you know, I don't know if this has been on the podcast before, but you know, it is what it is. Um, we've had so many beers. <laughs> This is a Grizzly, the Grizzly Paw Brewing Company, and they're in Canmore, Alberta. So another little Alberta brewery, and it's called the Rudding Elk Red. A uh, little five percent beer. It's it's pretty tasty. I gotta say, it's it's an enjoyable beer. And I'm gonna, I think what I'm gonna do over the next month is I'm gonna try a bunch of uh, the Grizzly Paw Brewing Company's beers just kind of, because I like one of the things, uh, being this year, or at least, um, I'm kind of like into let's go to a brewery and let's just try a whole bunch of their stuff. And then I'll mm-hmm. move on to another brewery and try a bunch of their stuff. Cause normally the way I do it is I go from one brewery to the next brewery, to the next brewery. So, um, you know, I chose, I chose these guys and I'm going to try a few, I think from them over the next bit and see what I think, but this one's a good, it's a good first one. So well done guys on that. I think that's a good strategy and uh, never been, but I hear Canmore, Alberta is beautiful here. It's a beautiful place. Um, I'm having, I don't think I've, I know I've definitely had one from, from this brewery. 
Uh, but I don't know if I've had this one. So this is from... This is from La Cervecería Astilleros. <laughs> okay. Nice. Uh, and this is the El Hugo Mango Kolsch. Oh. Uh, and they're uh, and they're from uh, North Vancouver, North Vancouver Brewery, and uh, it's good. It doesn't have a really strong mango taste to it, but it's got like a little something to it. But um, it's it's tasty. It's been going down nice and easy for me. So that sounds like a really nice summer beer. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why it jumped. Up. Maybe it's because it's like I can feel springtime coming. Like yeah. just just a whisper of it <laughs> here in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, by the time that people hear this one, it will, will be well in, into springtime, but uh, the time of recording this, we're, it's late February, so I'm, I'm dreaming of spring right <laughs> yeah. now. <laughs> so it helps with that, that's for sure. Love spring. Yeah. All right. Well, well, let's, let's, yeah. well let's wrap this one up. Do you have final thoughts or do you want me to go first? I can, I can just, I can just jump in. Why right. not? Take yeah. I've, I've, uh, this was a surprise conversation for me. I did, had no idea that this was going to be a, our topic of discussion today. Um, but I'm, I'm glad we did because this, this has really given me something to, to chew on as far as like this, this important distinction between refining and perfecting. And, you know, I've been well aware of the, the pitfalls and traps of perfectionism, but this just adds a whole new color and layer to it. And in many ways is, is created something that's a bit more tangible and actionable just for me personally, where it's like, yeah, just refine, refine. It's process, it's process, it's process. Um, and just like a terrific reminder of like, yeah, just like, like just move forward, do it, do it boldly, try things out, play and come back, throw things away, keep some things, keep, just keep refining because the, the, that process, that process really is there to help you. Like it, it helps you in, in any sort of creative thing that, that you're doing where it's, um, it is, it's, it's an experiment, you know, it's like, let's go with this. Okay. That was better. Let's do it. Try it again. Okay. That's even better. Let's do that. Okay. No, no, that's not quite the right direction. Let, but let's go back to that thing that we had, you know, you just keep on with that process and, and with it, uh, as you, as you brought in, you know, there's, it comes with it, a kind of spirit, you know, there's a, there's a, and an atmosphere of, refining over perfecting that just gives you more room and uh, for any regular listeners you know that I'm a fan of room having room to create is is so important to feel like you have some space to work in and the most amount of space that you you have to work in I think is um and by that I mean mental space hmm. where you feel most free to to try things, do things like that's, that's really the space that I'm talking about. And I think that this, this flipping our ideas from perfectionism to refinement is, is another beautiful way for us to create that inner space to allow the best of us to come out. I like it. I, I agree with everything you said. It was really well summed up. I suppose, okay, I'll add one thing that we didn't really talk about, but I'll just add this to kind of my closing concept because it was a thought I had as I was going through this one. Be mindful that sometimes refinement can make things like too much. You can like add too much to it and and just pay attention to that because um, there is a, like I can do this and I can do that. I can do everything. And then you just like, do too much. And I think there is a, there is something really important about simplicity. And I think also that when you are in the spirit of refinement, you actually embrace simplicity and you might find out that simplicity actually works better than you think. 
Um, this was something I realized kind of last night when I was doing my work, because I basically would like threw my hands up and said, okay, you're either going to bed and you're not getting anything done, or you're actually going to accomplish something. And I said, let's just keep it simple. And, and weirdly keeping it simple worked. There's a couple of things that I'll add to it, but like it could have very easily gotten too complex. And so, um, you know, I think as you kind of go off from this podcast and you think about what you're doing, I mean, you know, I, I, I actually, you know what, I'll say this, this is something that I've been working on with my clients recently, that it's not about the best idea or the right idea. It's like you, you, you go with the idea that works. It like naturally works. Like, like when you're putting together a story, say some event happens and then it pops in your mind, well, this event happened, maybe that happens. That's the right answer. It, and it came out of another inspiration. So like refinement happens almost spontaneously at times. And it's only right because you stay in flow and you trust that what you did led to the next thing and it all naturally just fits, right? Like you're not pulling your ideas out of the blue. There's a foundation in what you build when you let that first crude idea out. It actually sometimes is the foundation of building much better ideas around it. And then ultimately what started out as a crude idea actually ends up being the perfect idea, but you couldn't see it until all the pieces were built around it. So, um, you know, I, as I walk away from this podcast, I guess the thing that I'm really just going to look at what I do is I'm just going to look at it in terms of like, okay, like, what, what am I trying to do? Let's just take a step in that direction and let's see what it is. And then once I see what it is, then I can make my next decision. And I'm not going to, I'm going to be mindful not to get too far ahead of that. You know, I'm going to try to stay really present in like, this is what I'm doing right now. And I'm just going to fully do that. And it's kind of reminds me, it's like, this is like every artist lesson I've ever learned. It's like, just be present, do what you're doing right now. Let that be enough. And then when you get to whatever that place is, your next step will appear. Thank you for listening in on our conversation today. We hope you found something helpful that you can carry forward with you. Head over to our website, wayoftheartist.com, for more free exclusive material and learn about the show. If you haven't already, please support us by subscribing to the show, sharing it with people you know, and keeping compassionate, creative conversation going.